trying to define consciousness is the problem. Well, actually, the problem is the word. Consciousness is a noun. And as soon as we use a noun, we make it a thing. Something to be known, to be observed, to be recognized, to be defined. And yet consciousness, you say, is that which is knowing. That's, it is the knowing. It is the defining. And so the very use of the word consciousness, I think, is wrong. I think we can use consciousness in the sense of, you know, we say a person loses consciousness or whatever, regains consciousness. But we can't talk about what is consciousness. Because when you add ness to, in any word, when you add N-E-S-S, what you're doing is you're taking an adjective and turning it into a noun in order to talk about the quality of that thing. So you could say boldness is the quality of being bold. Blueness is the quality of being blue. But you can't define blueness. You can define blue by example or bold by its a description. And so the real question is, what does it mean to be conscious? That's the question. And as soon as we say, what is consciousness, we're on a wrong track. And I think that's, you know, the whole field of consciousness studies is on the wrong track in that way, because they're looking for consciousness as a thing. And it's not. So the real question is, is what does it mean to be conscious, rather than what is consciousness? And that we all know. You know, we, we are all aware, conscious beings. It's the only thing we absolutely know for sure, is that we, we are knowing this experience. You know, we are knowing what we're seeing out there. We are knowing the thoughts that come through our minds. We're knowing the feelings we're having. And all of that is happening, you could say, because we are conscious, because we are knowing it, because we are aware. And science has basically ignored that, this faculty of being aware. And for good reasons, apparently for good reasons. One, you can't tie being aware down. You can't measure it in any way. And you can't even be sure whether someone is aware inside or not. So it doesn't fit into that scientific discipline of study. Also, science is wanting to be objective and not get into subjectivity, which con being conscious is totally subjective. But I think the main reason is that it hasn't needed to, because science describes the world perfectly well without having to worry the least bit about what it means to be conscious. And it's just in recent years that it's begun to you know, ask this question, what is consciousness? I mean, I use that phrase because that's what they're asking, although as I say, I think it's the wrong question. And that's mainly, I think, because of where neuroscience has gone in recent years, just the study of the brain is obviously in interfacing with that whole question of what does it mean to be aware and the whole question of how does the brain generate experience. The key thing there is, I think, people confuse two questions. And that is, how does the brain generate the contents of experience, the thoughts, the images, the perceptions, the feeling? And the other question is, does it generate being conscious? Does it generate awareness, consciousness as such? And... I think the whole, not the whole, but 99.9% .9 of the scientific community confuses those two. And so because the brain clearly plays an important role, probably a, maybe a sole role, in the generating of experience, maybe every single experience we have correlates with some activity in the brain. I, you know, who knows? But I, if that was the case, I wouldn't be upset by that. And they therefore make the conclusion that the brain is generating the capacity to be aware. That's what David Chalmers distinguishes as the easy and hard problems of consciousness. He says the easy problems are understanding how the brain works. You know, we might one day know enough about the brain to know exactly what happens when you fall in love or solve a certain mathematical problem or even just you know, processing a visual scene like this. We may one day know all that. 
they're the easy problems, the so-called easy problems. The hard problem is why does any of that brain activity actually give rise to subjective experience? Why, is, why are we aware? And the current paradigm, the current, well, I call it a meta-paradigm in science. It's, it's the paradigm behind the paradigms. I mean, you're all familiar with the concept of paradigm in various scientific fields. What I call the meta-paradigm is, is the paradigm behind all the different paradigms in the science, which is basically the materialistic paradigm, meta-paradigm, which says that the real world is the world of space, time, and matter, and once we understand that fully, we will understand everything, and is therefore assumed that when we understand space, time, and matter fully, we will understand how being aware comes into existence. And I see the very fact we are aware is the thing that completely throws that meta-paradigm into disarray. It's the, it's the anomaly. It's what Kuhn, in his work, described as the, the anomaly. Any, a paradigm meets an anomaly, something that cannot be denied and cannot be explained. He showed how it goes through phases. You ignore it. You then try and integrate it within the existing paradigm. And then eventually some brave soul comes along and challenges the fundamental assumption, like Copernicus challenged the fundamental assumption that the Earth was a centre, and a new model begins to emerge. And I think that's where we are with the whole subject of consciousness. We're not at the stage of a new model yet, we're at the stage of trying to fit it into the old meta-paradigm, the old materialistic meta-paradigm. And I think the fact we are aware is the real anomaly. It's not psychic experiences or healing or those sorts of things. I mean, they are certainly a puzzle as to how they happen, and they are certainly anomalies. But they're, they're not a true anomaly because they're not universally accepted. You know, a lot of people don't accept the evidence for healing or whatever, or they try and explain it within the materialistic paradigm, some sort of electromagnetic effect or something. The fact we are aware is, is a true anomaly because it is absolutely undeniable. It's the one thing we know for absolutely certain is that we, we are aware. And that's what Descartes was getting at with his cogito, cogito ergo sum, which is often mistranslated and misunderstood. It's often translated as I think, therefore, I think, therefore I am, and is understood as my thinking creates my sense of existence. What Descartes was actually doing was looking for absolute truth. And he sat down one night to see what, what was it he couldn't doubt. He said, whatever must be absolutely true, must be beyond any doubt. And he realized he could doubt you know, everything he was seeing in the room, it could just be stuff that was being fed into his brain by some demon, as he put it. Um, and he thought, well, I can't doubt you know, the actual experience I'm having. And he realized, no, because sometimes I'm having dreams and I wake up, so, but I don't doubt the dream when I'm in the dream. And he went through this process and finally realized the one thing he couldn't doubt was that he was doubting and that he knew he was doubting. And it was the knowing, and that's why it's cogito, I know, therefore my knowing proves my being. So what he was saying is, is the knowingness, the knowing, which is another way to put it, conscious, being conscious, the fact that I know my experience is the one thing I cannot deny. I can question everything about my experience, but the fact I know my experience is undeniable. And that's, that's what I'm saying. You know, we, we all know we are experiencing. It is undeniable. And... There is nothing in the current scientific worldview that can explain. There's lots of theories, hypotheses, attempts to explain how consciousness can come out of quantum processes or chemical processes in the brain, but no one's come up with any satisfactory explanation. So it's a real anomaly. And what's happening at the moment is everybody's trying to fit the explanations into the current materialistic paradigm. 
and I see the basic problem. Well, this is what Ch I mean. I see it. Chalmers nailed it very succinctly about 15 years ago. He said, "How does dead, unconscious, and sentient matter, any any process occurring in matter, which is assumed to be insentient, how can any process ever then give rise to experience?" subjective experience which is totally non-material. So basically how does the material world give rise to the immaterial experience? Mm. And that's where I think that you know the questions need separating. You'd say how, how the brain determines the forms that arise in experience. That's the easy question. But how does how does any material process ever give rise to subjectivity? The the knowing, being aware. You know, there's various sort of ironies or paradoxes here because the whole of science takes place in the mind. It's all thoughts, theories, ideas. Science needs the mind and yet it's the one thing it cannot explain and in some ways would almost be happier if the mind didn't exist. My view is the, the alternative meta-paradigm, which I think is beginning to come out various people are beginning to talk about in different ways, is to say that it isn't that space, time and matter are primary. It is that being conscious, that quality of knowingness, is, is fundamental. And there's various ways of seeing that. I mean, one, as I said, it's, it's the one thing we can count on, is the fact we are knowing. And everything, everything we know, everything is actually an appearance in the mind. That's all we ever know is what appears in the mind. And then we give it objective reality because it all seems to fit together and you know this this table always remains hard and so there seems to be an objective world out there, but actually all we ever know is subjectivity. And I think that that quality is something which is in all all creatures. Again, people often talk about, you know, oh, human beings are conscious, but other animals aren't. You see this the whole time in scientific literature. Only human beings are conscious animals. The, we're the only conscious creature. And my retort to that is, well, then why would you bother giving a dog an anesthetic when you operate? Why would you want to make it unconscious if you don't believe it's conscious in the first place? Clearly, what, they, what they're talking about is self-consciousness which is, are we conscious that we're conscious? I think all animals are conscious. Any creature is, an, any experiencing being, or any being, any entity, I would say, has an element of inner awareness. I think it's actually intrinsic to life. And that's the other problem with the current materialistic meta-paradigm, is if, if the brain does create that quality of subjectivity, at what stage in evolution did it happen? Does it happen with human beings? Did it happen with rats? Does it happen with fish, insects? Wherever you draw the line, you've got to say below the line there's purely dead matter. And somewhere above the line, immediately above the line, something magic happens and subjectivity appears. It seems much simpler to me to just say that quality of being aware is always there, always there. And what has evolved as life has evolved and nervous systems have evolved and senses have evolved is not the capacity for knowing but the complexity of the forms that arise in the mind and so with human beings we are you know we have similar senses to animals except you know dogs and hear more sounds than we do and smell better than we do so in some senses they're more conscious in the sensory realm but what we've added in is thinking, self-awareness, and with that a whole expansion of our awareness of time, which has really made human consciousness a lot richer. So I see the evolution of consciousness is not that consciousness suddenly evolved at a certain time, but the evolution of the forms that arise in consciousness as the, the nervous systems evolved with it.